So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. In need of references for your research? Do you want a search engine that is easy to navigate? And do you want it free? If you are a student, researcher, or teacher looking for socioeconomic references and materials, then SERPI is for you. To access SERPI, just visit the PIDS website at www.pids.gov.ph and click the SERPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SERP is an online database of socioeconomic studies and materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and other academic and research institutions. SERP has a wide variety of socioeconomic materials such as journal articles, books, working papers, policy notes, research papers, and newsletters. SERPI has 52 partner institutions that contribute publications to the database. SERPI has a wide coverage of materials encompassing 20 research themes. You can search by keyword or author, by publication type, by research theme, or year published. SERPI has more than 7,000 materials with full text that you can download for free. Enjoy searching! Visit SERPI now and follow us on Facebook. You may also send a message for inquiries. The COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating digitalization transforming how we work, socialize, and create economic value. Today, tech companies play a leading role in the global economy. They optimize business operations to expand markets, connect people, and empower small businesses. Digital platforms also deliver essential services, including critical ones like health, and education. They provide credit to SMEs by utilizing data on their operations. They also create entirely new jobs, unheard of just a few years ago. Consumers, businesses, households, and governments alike enjoy many benefits from digital platforms. However, 
digital platforms disrupt markets and businesses. Increasingly, online businesses contribute to shop closures and the loss of jobs. They also create gig work with little job security or protection. Regulators still need to resolve tax leakages. And big tech erodes domestic competition for some countries. There are issues surrounding loss of privacy, cybersecurity, and misinformation. Also, the gap between the tech haves and the tech have-nots could exacerbate inequality. Internet access must be made more inclusive across developing Asia. Closing the digital divide, particularly for women and the elderly, is critical. How can we all work together to ensure digital platforms promote inclusive development in Asia and the Pacific? To find out, read the latest Asian Economic Integration Report. So what is BIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or BIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, EIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Service through policy research. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan yung batas at polisiya para mas makita nila yung epekto at resulta nito. <sighs> Pag nahuli tayo, wala tayong may sasagot. Kaya dapat pag-aralan din natin. Oo, dapat nilang pag-aralan ng mga batas at polisiya para malaman nila kung epektibo ba ito sa karamihan o magiging problema lang. Kung walang basihan ang isang batas, basta na lamang ipatutupad at walang pulso na kinukuha sa mga mamamayan, eh, mahirap. Mahalagang isailalim sa masusing pagsusuri ang mga polisiya at programa ng pamahalaan bago pa man ito ipatupad. Dapat rin ipagpatuloy ang pagsubaybay o pagmonitor sa mga ito habang ipinapatupad hanggang sa matapos ang kanilang implementasyon. Dito pumapasok ang tungkuli na ginagampanan ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Ang PIDS ang siyang sangay ng pamahalaan na naatasang gumawa ng pag-aaral at pananaliksik at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas at iba't ibang sangay ng gobyerno tungkol sa mga programa at polisiya sa pamahalaan upang masigurong matugunan nito ang socio-economic needs ng ating bansa. Pag pinag-aralan, mas effective! The COVID-19 pandemic is accelerating digitalization 
transforming how we work, socialize, and create economic value. Today, tech companies play a leading role in the global economy. They optimize business operations to expand markets, connect people, and empower small businesses. Digital platforms also deliver essential services, including critical ones like health and education. They provide credit to SMEs by utilizing data on their operations. They also create entirely new jobs, unheard of just a few years ago. Consumers, businesses, households, and governments alike enjoy many benefits from digital platforms. However, digital platforms disrupt markets and businesses. Increasingly, online businesses contribute to shop closures and the loss of jobs. They also create gig work with little job security or protection. Regulators still need to resolve tax leakages. And big tech erodes domestic competition for some countries. There are issues surrounding loss of privacy, cybersecurity, and misinformation. Also, the gap between the tech haves and the tech have nots could exacerbate inequality. Internet access must be made more inclusive across developing Asia. Closing the digital divide, particularly for women and the elderly, is critical. How can we all work together to ensure digital platforms promote inclusive development in Asia and the Pacific? To find out, read the latest Asian Economic Integration Report. Welcome to the PIDS webinar series. Before we start the webinar, we would like to give you a few reminders. For attendees, your microphone is muted upon entry. In case you have a question, the moderator will read it during the open forum. For those attending via Cisco WebEx, use the chat box located at the lower part of the screen. Click the chat icon, type your name and affiliation, and your question, and send to all panelists. You may send your questions while the presentation is in progress. The moderator will read them during the open forum. For Facebook viewers, at least two questions from the comment section will be read by the moderator during the open forum. We will moderate all questions to ensure that they are relevant to the scope of the presentation. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to your active participation. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sheila Sierra of PIDS, and I will be moderating this event. Welcome to the first webinar of PIDS this March, which we are holding in partnership with the Asian Development Bank. For today, we'll be talking about the rapid ascent of the digital economy in the Philippines and the rest of Asia. Our conversation will cover not just the opportunities that this phenomenon brings, but also the issues that need to be addressed, such as the challenge of defining and measuring the dig digital economy. To officially open our event, I now give the floor to the president of PIDS, 
Dr. Celia Reyes. Ma'am Cel? Thank you, Sheila. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I'd like to acknowledge the presence of the following. Uh, former PIDS Board Chair, MEDA Secretary and UP School of Economics Professor Emeritus Ernesto Pernia, former PIDS President Dr. Joseph Yap, former PIDS President and currently PIDS Board Member Dr. Gilbert Tianto. And from the government, we have the Department of Information and Communication Technology under Secretary Dennis Villorente, NEDA Assistant Secretary Roderick Planta, Department of Labor and Employment, Bureau of Local Employment, Assistant Secretary Dominic Tutay, Philippine Guarantee Corporation Senior Vice President Ian Briones, Small Business Corporation Senior Vice President Josefina Flores, Land Bank of the Philippines Assistant Vice President Rayo Andarino, Senate Economic Planning Office Director General Ronald Golding, Representative Christopher de Venecia of the 4th District of Pangasinan, executive directors, directors, and other officials of various government offices who are with us today. We're also joined this afternoon by uh, representatives from the private sector, Semiconductor and Electronics Industries in the Philippines, President Dan La Chica, In One Go Technologies, President Ramon Garcia, Hyundai Group Senior Vice President Mon Gutierrez, Vital PH Science Vice President Virgilio Galvez, Ascend Vice President Jeff Cadula, Udena Infrastructure Corporation Assistant Vice President for Operations, Manuel Hamunir. Mango System Technologies Chief Executive Officer, Paul Anthony Pasqual. Directors and officials of various private organizations are joining the webinar this afternoon. And from the academe, we have Asian Institute of Management Executive Director, uh, Hamil Paolo Francisco, University of the Philippines Open University Chancellor, Melinda Bandalaria. Cavite State University Director Orlando de los Reyes, Polytechnic University of the Philippines Open University Executive Director Carmen Cita Castolo, Ateneo de Manila University Dean Fernando Aldaba, University of Asia and the Pacific Dean of School of Economics George Manzano, Mater Day Academy Dean Ross Alonso, St. Paul University Deans Anunciacion at Talosig and Marifel Grace Coomer, Cavite State University Dean Maria Cynthia de la Cruz. And we also have with us this afternoon United Nations Development Program Philippines Deputy Resident Representative Enrico Gabeglia, um, Embassy of Mexico in the Philippines Head of Bilateral Cooperation and Economic Affairs Juan Gabriel Espejo Ceballos, APEC Business Advisory Council Director Antonio Basilio, Asian Development Bank Director General Edimon Ting, and Director Sinyong Park. Simio Inotech Director Ramon Bacani, Philippine Exporters Confederation Assistant Vice President Maria Flor de Rizalion, Philippine NGO Council on Population Health and Welfare Executive Director Eden Divina Gracia, Masagana Sakahan Director Daniel Agustin, and Samahan ng Kabataang Voluntaryo ng Pilipinas, Deputy Regional Director Albert Lee. Let me also greet and welcome our guests, colleagues from the government, academe, civil society, media, private sector, as well as those who are watching through the PIDS Facebook page. Today's virtual event is a joint undertaking between PIDS and the Asian Development Bank. We would like to thank ADB for co-organizing this webinar with us. Over the years, we saw how technology has improved the way we live and work. Not only has it made connecting and interacting with one another more convenient and affordable, it also opened vast opportunities for development and economic growth, including trade. This afternoon, ADB senior economist James Villafuerte will be sharing with us their Asian Economic Integration Report for 2021, which tackled the increasing use and adoption of digital technology and its impacts on the lives of people, especially in the pandemic period. We will learn about the benefits and opportunities brought about by digital transformation, as well as the risk and challenges that come with it. When the COVID-19 pandemic struck, people resorted to technology to go about their daily lives. More and more businesses, as well as other sectors and industries globally, began shifting to the digital economy, more specifically the platform economy, to be able to reach their target markets. 
in a study authored by PIDS Senior Research Fellow Dr. Jose Ramon Albert, which should be presented this afternoon. Platform is defined as a digital intermediary and infrastructure that brings together various parties through the internet to interact, thereby matching supply and demand in a multi-sided market. These platforms, according to the Center for Global Enterprise, include transaction platforms such as Grab and Uber, innovation platforms such as the iOS and Android operating systems, integration platforms such as Google, Apple, Facebook, and Alibaba, and investment platforms such as Rocket Internet. We will know more about this later. The digital economy is one of the most important drivers of innovation, competitiveness, and growth. It has transformed the landscape of job market, corporate competition, and the global economy as a whole. Specifically, it led to a significant growth opportunity for businesses that trade online and provided consumers with opportunities to purchase an expanding range of products from a large number of suppliers at lower prices. Alongside this increasing preference for digital economy during the pandemic, however, are the widening digital divide and the emergence of data privacy and security issues, among others. Dr. Albert's study also pointed out the need to address measurement issues in order for us to better understand the size and scope of the digital economy and fully tap its potential. At this point, let me thank our co-organizer, ADB Chief Economist and Director General of the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department, Dr. Yasuyuki Sawada, Speakers ADB Senior Economist Mr. James Villafuerte, PIDA Senior Research Fellow Dr. Jose Ramon Albert, as well as our discussants, Department of Trade and Industry Undersecretary Rafaelita Adaba, Philippine 7 Corporation President Mr. Jose Victor Paterno, ADB's Digital Technology for Development Chief Mr. Thomas Abel, and Senator Sonny Angara, who will give the closing message for accepting our invitation. Thank you so much for sharing with us your insights, experiences, and recommendations on how we can best maximize the benefits of technology and con continuously innovate amid these trying times. I look forward to everyone's participation in our webinar today. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you very much, Mamsel. At this point, I would like to call Dr. Yasuyuki Sawada, Chief Economist and Director General of ADB's Economic Research and Regional Operation Department. He is the Chief uh, Spokesperson of ADB on Economic and Development Trends and leads the production and dissemination of ADB's flagship knowledge products, as well as ADB support for various regional cooperation fora such as the ASEAN Plus 3 and APEC. You now have the floor, Dr. Sawada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Seria Reyes, Department of Trade and Industry and the Secretary Rafarita Aldaba, a Philippine Seven Corporation President and CEO Jose Victor Paterno, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good afternoon and welcome to this public webinar on digital platforms implication for the Philippines and developing Asia. Increased computing power and access to affordable smart devices have brought digital technology into our hands, along with the proliferation of apps like Lazada, Food Panda, Grab among others, uh, these platforms have revolutionized our lives, really. Last year, the power of these apps enabled society and the economy to remain open and connected despite the COVID-19 pandemic. Through Zoom meetings like us, uh, telehealth consultations, online education, and digital payment, people were also uh, able uh, to continue their daily activities with uh, little risk of infection. I, I thought this is a really amazing achievement. Uh, in fact, uh, recently, I returned back from Tokyo to Manila, and I was under very strict uh, self-quarantine for two weeks. Uh, I just finished this uh, self-quarantine. But while I was doing uh, self-quarantine, I was not allowed to go outside. But uh, I could get uh, food, uh, fresh food, fresh meat, and everything online delivered almost immediately. So I thought that this is really uh, uh, amazing progress we are uh, uh, encountering. Uh, having said this, um, uh, 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 the increased use of uh, these additional uh, platforms is really uh, expected to continue this year and the years to come. Let's know our recent study, if digital sectors expand by 20% from year 2020 baseline, by year 2025, over five years, for five years, global output would rise by 4.3 trillion annually 
and Asia output uh, increase 1.7 trillion uh, annually. So I thought this is really enormous uh, gain uh, we, we can envision. However, uh, while digital platforms are helpful, they are also disruptive. Uh, they tend to ease out traditional businesses. They create many risks and challenges, including issues related to privacy and cybersecurity, tax arbitrage, loopholes, and anti-competitive uh, behavior. Uh, these must be addressed to minimize the risk to our safety and financial uh, stability. So in step with this, increase the access to quality ICT infrastructure, information communication technology infrastructure, promoting digital skills and literacy, providing safe and secure online payment system, granting financial access for innovative startups, and promoting efficient government and effectively legal and regulatory frameworks are all needed to maximize the overall net gains uh, out of uh, digital transformation. This is the topic, our joint event with PIDS today, and I'm really get excited. I'm, look for, I'm looking forward to a fruitful and lively discussion uh, today. Thank you. Thank you very much, and good afternoon again. Thank you very much, Dr. Sawada. Uh, friends, before we uh, go to the presentations, let us have a brief photo opportunity with all our speakers. So Dr. Reyes, Dr. Sawada, presenters and discussants, please uh, turn on your video and give us your best smile. Gwen, our platform host, will give us the cue. Gwen? I'm just waiting for the other speakers to turn on their videos. Okay, one, please put on your best smile. One, two, three, one, two, three, and one, two, three. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, um, let us now listen to the keynote presentation, which, which is the theme chapter of ADB's um, Asian Economic Integration Report 2021. And to give the presentation is Mr. James Villafuerte, a uh, country economist for Indonesia and um, senior economist in the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department of ADB. He is a seasoned macroeconomist with over 15 years of a professional work experience in policy analysis, economic modeling, regional cooperation, reform strategy, and economic management. James, over to you. Thank you, Sheila, at magandang hapon sa lahat ng uh, nanonood. Uh, as Celia mentioned, uh, this study is a one-year collaboration between the ADB and uh, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, and I'm just presenting the results, but there are so many authors that has worked to deliver this outstanding uh, study on digital platform. Next slide, please. As we all know, uh, digital technology has evolving, has been evolving rapidly. And at the base of, of this technological, digital technological explosion is really the rapid advancement in semiconductor technology, which has allowed us uh, to do massive computing and to use data in our uh, daily lives. Uh, so there are two enabling uh, technology that have uh, delivered this uh, rapid advance. One is the use of smart devices, and the other one is uh, the av availability of technology. On top of this uh, infrastructure technology, we also have transaction technology such as uh, digital ID and online payment, which are allowing the proliferation of these apps, which we almost use interactively every day in our social affairs, when we buy food or order our uh, uh, other needs, as well as even when we study and uh, do, do digital health consultations. Uh, more recently, integrating technologies like drones and artificial intelligence have really uh, mushroomed, and this will actually lead more benefit. Uh, next slide, please. To give you a sense of how important this uh, digital platform or digital economy is, uh, in 2017, UNCTAD has measured the total capital of firms involved in digital platform, and they've estimated that it is equivalent to around 20% of global GDP or around 17 trillion. For our study, we look at the B2C, the business to customer revenue in 2019 generated by digital platforms globally. And what we realize is that 
uh, these uh, business uh, models actually generates roughly around 3.8 trillion B2C revenue in 2019, and that is actually equivalent to around uh, over 4% of uh, global GDP. For Asia, uh, I think uh, the share of Asia in, in that global revenue is actually quite large. Uh, it's uh, uh, about half at 1.8 trillion, which is equivalent to about 6% of the region's GDP. So you can see that while these uh, industry and business models have only emerged recently, they are already contributing much to the growth in the region. In terms of uh, sectors, we know that e-commerce is really uh, the biggest uh, uh, generator of revenue, which actually generates roughly about 1.9 uh, trillion in 2019. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, one interesting story in our research is that uh, apparently Asia is actually in the center of this digital platform development and competition. And you can actually, uh, this is actually evident when you look at the region because most of the big technology company are actually in the region trying to capture its market size. So this chart shows you uh, the, the per capita spending, uh, the penetration rate, uh, as well as the size of uh, the number of digital market users uh, in the world and in the region. And one interesting thing that uh, comes out from the chart is in terms of the number of market users, uh, the red ones are the users in Asia. You can see that Asia actually dominates uh, the market users in terms of this digital platform. So, for example, if you we talk about e-commerce globally, there are about 3.2 billion users of e-commerce, and more than 60% of the e-commerce uh, users, or roughly close over 1.9 billion, are actually located in the region. But aside from these very large users of uh, digital platforms in Asia, the, the growth opportunities for digital platform in the region is very high. If you look at the per capita spending uh, in Asia, what you would notice is that compared to uh, per capita spending in the US, they are actually quite low. And even in terms of the penetration rate, the penetration rate uh, for Asia is actually quite low, which tells us that there's the room for growth is actually much higher. Despite this very low per capita spending and low penetration rate, however, the growth of digital platform revenue in Asia is much, much faster than the growth in the US or in Europe. For example, in Asia, digital platforms growing at around 16%, whereas uh, in the US and Europe, they're growing below 10%. So that tells us that actually uh, the importance of digital platform as a source of growth is really uh, very critical. Unfortunately, one characteristic of digital platform, and I know you're all aware of this, is that these digital platforms are highly concentrated. If you look at the top 70 companies, 70 digital platforms uh, in, the, in the world, most of them would actually be uh, uh, either American digital platforms or digital platforms from the People's Republic of China. Uh, one other fact as well is that if you look at Asia, the story in terms of readiness uh, of countries to leverage on this digital technology actually varies quite a lot. Next slide, please. Digital platforms uh, basically spread benefits in three critical ways. Um, I think for the market, uh, the, the most important part is that uh, this digital platform brings a lot of innovation. And, and you can see this because what they've done is they've bundled the ordering, the payment and the delivery in one go, and thereby they've created large network externalities. For business, digital platforms are also allowing greater participation by smaller players like households or even individuals who could actually join the platform and provide uh, services and goods like, for example, uh, delivering a uh, package or cooking uh, meals or cooking uh, special dessert like buku pie, which is actually one of Yasu's favorite. Oh, so that, that greater participation allows greater generation of income. And one story from the COVID is that many households who have lost job actually participated in either for example delivery of food or delivery of packages and also cooking for communities especially those that have been dislocated because of lockdown uh, for buyers i think the benefit that this platform really offer is the the ease the convenience and the customization which has been uh, enabled by 
the large computing power as well as access to Wi-Fi. Next slide, please. As you soon mentioned, uh, in our study, we did a CGE simulation to look into the macroeconomic benefit of digital platforms. So in the simulation exercise, we assumed that uh, digital inputs uh, for uh, the, the Asian and the global economy actually increases from 2021 to 25 by 20% over the baseline by 2025. And what we found out in that in that um, simulation exercise is that the, the the output impact, the impact on trade and employment are quite substantial. As mentioned by Yasu uh, earlier, for example, globally, because of this increased use of digital inputs, uh, global output would increase by over 4.3 trillion a year, which is actually equivalent to the 5.4 percent of the 2020 baseline. Uh, for Asia. Uh, the increased output will be equivalent to 1.7 trillion, which is almost 6% of the 2020 baseline output. The trade impact is equally large. For the world, uh, total trade will increase by over 2.4 trillion a year, which is about 5.5% of the 2020 baseline. And for Asia, it's the increment in, in global trade is the increment in the regional trade is about a trillion a year. And more importantly, uh, the job generation is that it is also quite large. Usually people are quite skeptical about technology because we think that this will actually uh, destroy jobs. But what we found out in this study is that on a net basis, it actually creates more jobs. So in the, in the, in the exercise, if digital inputs increases by 20% by 2025, globally an additional job of about 140 million will be created. And of these 140 million, 65, around 66, a million jobs will actually be generated in the region. If you look at the table, one, one interesting insight from the table as well is that countries and regions will benefit from digital transformation uh, differently. There will be uh, other regions or countries will gain more uh, compared to the others. So in particular, for example, the Pacific region, Southeast Asia region, Central Asia region, and Japan, if you look at the table, are actually uh, benefiting uh, by a large proportion. These benefits basically stem from three things. One, I think first, it, these benefits stem from the ability of digital connectivity to really respond and address some of the geographical challenges that could arise actually from those countries that are either a sea lock or landlocked. The second um, the source of this large benefit is that digital technology actually allows uh, a growth in productivity, which countries can actually leverage on to leapfrog the development process. So actually one insight from our study is that there is a possibility that countries can actually become middle income without developing a strong manufacturing sector by leveraging on this technology. And last but not the least, uh, increased uh, digital connectivity also allows uh, increased volume in terms of digitally enabled trade, which we know is the growing component of global trade. Next slide, please. Despite this uh, very rosy, uh, huge potential benefits from digital platform, there are many risks and challenges that we, we need to be aware of. That's why our view and uh, future, uh, uh, future view of, 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 this, of this digital transformation is, is also circumspected by, by some of these issues and challenges. One, for example, is the importance of digital divide. So uh, digital divide are multidimensional. It could be age, geographic location, it could be gender, it could be access to technology. And then I've also mentioned to you the highly concentrated nature of digital platform. And also some of these digital platforms have actually created a large class of interdependent contractors, which have little uh, pension, no leave benefits, and little social security. And of course, with the collection, sharing, and monetization of data, the issue of data privacy and security arises. And then you have the base erosion and profit shifting, where digital platform has actually lead, lead to tax leakage. These are all critical concerns. Next slide, please. For the Philippines, uh, the uh, for the Philippines, uh, one issue that I could see is actually its readiness. So we this table shows you the e-readiness of countries, and you can see that uh, the Philippines is actually belonging to the middle group uh, uh, we, in which case it is not 
uh, the, the digital, the, the degree of digital establishment in terms of technology, people, governance, and impact of technology is, is not, is not, is, is only modest. So what, what we need to, 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 to happen is that the Philippines should need to learn from advanced economies which have really established a digital platform as a, uh, as a driver for growth. Next slide, please. But in the, for the Philippines, uh, uh, just to mention, uh, in 2019, uh, digital platform generated about 11 billion uh, revenue uh, in, for the Philippines. Around 6 billion of this revenue are coming from uh, online tourism. 2.5 is from e-commerce and about 1 trillion is from advertising technology. In terms of uh, proportion to uh, GDP, that's only about 2.9%. So that tells you that compared to the region which generates roughly around 6% GDP revenue, the Philippines is only generating 3%. But in terms of the numbers of users, what you can see are uh, this orange bubble on the right-hand side is that the, the potential for the Philippines in terms of number of users is large. So for the Philippines, this is about, about 76 million uh, users of digital platform. That, so that means that if we do our policy right, we can actually use this as a leverage for growth. Next slide, please. But aside from this macroeconomic benefit, digital technology are also used in many ways. A good example is, for example, the uh, food uh, the food support program that ADB has conducted with the DSWD during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what, 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 what happened there is that because we don't have a good data on poverty maps, uh, ADB uh, used innovative data using satellite imagery uh, collecting night lights, looking at the materials of housing and roofing to conduct a very granular view of uh, the poor areas in Metro Manila. And that was actually used in terms of distributing the 5 million uh, Bayan Bayanihan program. Next slide, please. Another example of uh, innovation at work is Global Mobility Service, which is a fintech company partner again with the Philippines to deploy 100,000 uh, e-trike. Unfortunately, one of the constraints here is the availability of money from the poor people and what GMS did was it developed MCCS which actually remotely disable tricycle and in combination with GPS this becomes an alternative form of collateral gathering so even people without money can actually buy this tricycle so so the inclusive nature of this technology is actually quite large next slide please uh, there are six key priority uh, reform, uh, policy and reform areas which are actually needed to unlock them. And uh, the first one is really because of the low access uh, to online um, connection, investment in affordable and high quality ICT infrastructure is also needed. We also need to ensure uh, that um, finance, finance regulations uh, deliver a safe and secure e-payment. Uh, option uh, options because they are actually uh, uh, delivering the application of this technology. Uh, because Asia plays a major role in terms of the delivery of goods uh, and services in the region, we need to also invest in uh, logistics and delivery infrastructure. Uh, more importantly, in the region now, the, 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 the skills gap is quite large. And I have put here some, some estimate of job in technical areas, and we really need to ramp up our in, uh, uh, investment in digital skills and literacy by providing smart devices and also expanding the access of workers and students to online learning. Uh, because um, the base erosion and profit shifting concern is really vital, I think stronger regional cooperation to design more effective and more efficient Digital taxation policies are also needed. Last but not the least, we need to develop robust and strong regulation to ensure that we protect data, we protect privacy, and at the same time strengthen uh, cybersecurity. Uh, by the way, uh, in the top five risks for 2021, uh, data privacy, uh, identity fraud, and cybersecurity are actually in the top, top, top risk. So, so the last one is actually very critical. Um, next slide, please. So to conclude, um, I think digital platform has really transformed um, our lives and it's actually contributing huge macroeconomic benefit as well as making uh, small, small households as well as small business participate in, in the economic growth. However, there are many risks and challenges that we need to manage. 
And a, a menu for success is what I mentioned earlier. More importantly, the, the imperative of digital uh, divide is also important. And we have to make sure that no one is left behind. And I think investing in a robust and strong education and labor policy is critical. Last but not the least, digital a platform also play an important role for the Philippines. And um, for example, in the simulation, uh, we noted that if uh, the Philippine in digital sector input could increase by 20% uh, by 2025, it could actually add an additional output of about 37 billion and an additional jobs of about 2.2 million. Thank you for your attention and um, this ends my presentation. Thank you, Sheila. And thank you very much, uh, James, for giving us a very good regional overview of the growth of the digital economy. Um, speaking of challenges, our next presenter will discuss issues related to the definition and measurement of the digital economy. And he is a senior research, research fellow at PIDS with Education, Social Protection, Poverty, Big Data, Data Man in ICT as his areas of research expertise. He has a long list of achievements. Among these include serving as the Secretary General of the National Statistical Coordination Board, which was consolidated into various, into which was consolidated with other statistics offices into the Philippine Statistics Authority. Dr. Albert, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Sheila. Good afternoon. Uh, James already discussed the rise of digital platforms and estimates of the platform economy, both globally and in Asia as well as the social good arising from platforms. Measuring the size of a platform economy depends on what we mean by a platform. Thus, it is crucial to have a statistical framework for measuring the platform economy, which is the focus of my talk. Allow me to firstly situate the rise of platforms in the context of the rapid digitalization and use of the internet before I provide the main highlights of our study from a definition of platforms to topologies and data sources, then I close with a summary, policy implications and ways forward. The resulting digital transformation has been spurred by the rapid use of the internet. By end 2019, the internet has penetrated half of the population in Asia Pacific. A huge increase from 2005 when only less than 10% had access to the net. But we still have digital divides since the other half of Asia still has not used the net. Aside from the internet, there are also two drivers of increased digitalization, digital data and digital platforms. If we had a good estimate of the size of the platform economy, this could improve the accuracy of current macroeconomic and financial statistics. But measuring the platform economy is very complex. It's not straightforward. In the Philippines in particular, we have seen the rising use and importance of the internet and social media with the country leading the globe in time spent on the net, 10 hours on average. Some say partly because of the slow speed. The bulk of that time, over four hours, is spent on social media as of 2019 and recent data as of 2020 not cited in the study still suggests that the country continues to lead the world in use in time on you on the net and use of social media many filipino users of social media platforms like facebook and instagram are females and among the young age 20 18 to 24. thus social media influencers and platforms have targeted this social social media users for fashion and beauty products prior to the pandemic spending on e-commerce in the philippines is relatively small a total of $4.7 billion in 2018 on online purchases with more than three-fourths of this $3.5 billion on online travel purchases. And at per capita spending was just $18 on online consumer goods purchases in 2018. The PSA has, the Philippine Statistics Authority has recently come up with estimates of the digital economy, suggesting that the digital economy has risen from 6.9% of GDP in 2012 to 10.1% in 2018. Their concept of the digital economy is, however, much larger than the platform or internet economy. Other data producers have given alternative figures. Google Temasek and Bain says internet economy in Philippines is at 2.5 billion, equivalent to 2.1% of GDP, growing between 20% and 30% annually since 2015. 
Uh, the Hendrick Foundation says digital trade enabled benefits to Philippines were valued at 160 billion pesos or 3.2 billion dollars. Digital Filipino and iMetrics estimates that in uh, 2018, e-commerce was 9.5% of GDP based on their Purchasing Managers Index. These varying estimates of the internet economy are due to the differences in statistical frameworks, coverage, and data sources. It should be noted that the platform economy is not currently in the radar of most national statistics offices, given the absence of commonly accepted definition of what we mean by a platform or the platform economy and the wider digital economy and the digital sector. While the digital economy could be defined in terms of the digital sector, defining digital transactions could also be an alternative approach to defining the digital economy. And the possible criterion for di distinguishing transactions is how the transaction is made, what is transacted, and who is involved. Platform economy measurement is challenging since platforms might not be located physically in a country concerned. Thus, the economic transactions are not directly part of national statistics. Also, platforms are cross-sectoral and they don't easily fit in official classification systems. Another challenge is transactions are not always financial and businesses are not the only actors. A large number of persons also participate in platforms. However, ad hoc methods for instance, web scraping of site usage, together with conduct of new surveys, have been used by new data providers to estimate the platform economy. But the direction and extent of bias in these methods and the coverage is unknown. The starting point of a statistical framework in, in for measuring the platform economy are definitions and concepts. Following the definition of platforms as a digital intermediary and infrastructure that brings together various parties through the internet to interact, thereby matching supply and demand in a multi-sided mar market, we see that platforms are digital matchmakers. Aside from in infrastructure, interactions are also a functional layer of the platforms. Their relationships among actors, identified as B2B, B2C, C2C, and across time, uh, the distinction between C2C and B2C might be fuzzy. Uh, the study gives us uh, details on various features of platforms. Major ones include infrastructure, ecosystem, new business models, governance. And these features of platforms can lead us to categorize platforms in various ways, starting with functionalities, the strategies for platform participation, and a combination of criteria. We can also classify platforms structurally into super platforms, platform constellations, standalone platforms, but these typologies are fluid, partly because across time, the categories may not be mutually exclusive given the fast pace by which platforms retrofit themselves according to demands and their capabilities. Another key step in the statistical framework is identifying data needed and indicators to be measured. In these three slides, we give a sample of needed data and indicators on the platforms, the providers of service, and the platform users. It should be noted that a conceptual framework, beyond the conceptual framework, we also need a statistical framework such as uh, institutional arrangements to support uh, the integration of data compiled from various sources, Further, the conceptual framework should be operationalized as an integrated production chain from the collection of basic data to the communication of statistics. These indicators that I, we showed suggest uh, several data sources that are needed. Current surveys like the labor force surveys, the ICT usage of households and of businesses could be modified to target providers and users of platforms, but they don't target the online platforms themselves. So we need a new dedicated survey to, uh, to actually survey the online platforms. But the general experience is that platforms might not be willing to share information. If there is already a list of online platforms with URLs available, we could use web scraping to combine desired information from the websites of these platforms, uh, though this is not always a stra straightforward exercise. This innovative data source could be combined, however, with various traditional sources. Our, in the Philippines, our D Department of ICT conducted for the first time a household survey in ICT. Results suggest that among Filipinos aged 10 years and over, less than half 
use the internet, of which more than half are in Metro Manila and neighboring regions. Among Filipinos aged 10 years and over who go online, the bulk of internet activity is, surprise, surprise, on social media. 91% followed by access to information, 41%. Only around 6% and 1% respectively go online for professional life and online transactions. New data from Google Temasek uh, suggests that amid the pandemic, Filipinos have made much more use of platforms to cope with restrictions and movements, and that such behavior will be sustained in a post-COVID world. Our DICT survey suggested that a total of 15.5 billion pesos was spent in the country on online purchases. And for the total monthly income, average 12.3 billion pesos, clothing garnering a fifth of online income, a tenth went to cosmetics, another tenth came from income from food, including groceries, alcohol, and tobacco. Average monthly income of Filipinos from online selling was around 90 US dollars or 8,700 8, pesos. Some areas outside Metro Manila, particularly Davao and Eastern Visayas, led in average income from online selling. In summary, with the rise of platforms, new data are needed. Given the complex business processes of platforms, it's a statistical challenge to actually uh, obtain data from platforms. However, some work has begun on measuring the digital economy and specifically the platform economy. But this is a challenge because of the complexity, cross-sector and cross-border capacity and rapid growth of platforms. NSOs, however, can re-engineer their existing surveys, um, LFS, business surveys, household and business surveys on ICT usage, and supplement these traditional data sources with innovative data sources like web scraping. The challenge is how NSOs can incorporate these data sources into national accounting. For instance, in the case of households, we can't merely think of the household sector for, uh, for the expenditure side, but also from the production side, given the rising incomes and production from platform participation. Technology and platforms can bring about social good, but these developments may also bring about risks on fair competition, taxation, trustworthiness, consumer rights, data privacy, and decent working conditions. This requires at least some amount of regulation to maintain economic benefits and social good, as well as ensure that platform dividends are inclusive. But there must be a lot of care so that regulations do not give burdens that can stifle innovations. Thank you. That's all. Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Toots. Friends, let us continue the conversation by listening to the comments of our discussants on the two presentations, as well as their insights from the standpoint of the sector where they belong. You can see um, the names of our, um, our discussants on the screen. Uh, we will hear first from Dr. Rafaelita Orfit. Uh, Pita Aldaba, who is the Undersecretary for Competitiveness and Innovation of uh, the Philippine Department of Trade and Industry. Uh, she also serves as a member of the Board of Governors of the Philippine Board of Investments, and she's responsible for DTI's initiatives on innovation and entrepreneurship, startup ecosystem development, national competitiveness, accreditation of conformity assessment bodies, and trade and industrial policy research. And prior to her appointment in government, Dr. Aldaba served, prior to her appointment in, um, in the, at DTI, Dr. Aldaba served as a senior research fellow and acting vice president of PIDS. After Yusek Aldaba, we will hear from Mr. Uh, Jose Victor uh, Paterno, who is the president and chief executive officer of Philippine 7 Corporation, um, popularly known as 7-Eleven. He's a mechanical engineer by education, and he shifted to retailing when he joined the company as, at his father's invitation as construction and maintenance manager in 1993. He was appointed president and CEO of 7-Eleven um, uh, Philippines in 2005. After Mr. Paterno, we will have Mr. Thomas Abel, who is the chief of ADB's uh, Digital Technology for Development Unit. His team works with ADB member countries in supporting the transition to the digital um, economy and uh, provides assistance across many areas, including e-government, tech, 
tech startup ecosystems, technology policy, and tech industry partnerships. He has over 30 years of professional experience in digital technology, including technology policy and strategy, software development, and systems architecture. At this point, I invite all of you to listen to our first discussant, Undersecretary Pita Aldaba of the Department of Trade and Industry. Yusek Pita? Thank you so much, uh, Sheila. And um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Dr. Celia, uh, I, I, I think you're, you're, you're here. Dr. Celia Reyes, Mr. Sawada, and of course, our, our speakers, uh, Fruits and uh, James. Um, thank you uh, for those uh, very useful and very timely uh, presentation. Next slide, please. Well, what I did was uh, to um, uh, comment first on uh, the work of uh, the ADB um, and, and then uh, to be followed by some um, sharing as uh, I went through the paper of uh, Toots as well. Um, these are really um, very important uh, papers. Um, and um, I'm, I'm really glad that they were uh, both presented together because I see that uh, the ADB report um, actually provides uh, really a very comprehensive uh, picture of uh, the current situation in terms of uh, um, digital transformation that uh, all countries are now pursuing. Uh, it has looked at uh, the impact of COVID on trade, on investment, supply chain and mobility as well as emphasize the role of uh, digitalization and regional cooperation in economic recovery. And the paper, the paper um, actually focused as well in terms of harnessing digital trade opportunities such as uh, affordability, access to ICT, logistics and delivery infrastructure, regional efforts to modernize and harmonize regulations, e-payment availability and options, the legal, regulatory, and institutional reforms, along with e-readiness and digital uh, divide, as uh, also emphasized by James. Um, what is um, also very interesting in the report is that it was pointed out that while, of course, technology could be disruptive, but at the same time, it could usher a positive and inclusive development impacts. And um, I also summarized in here uh, the suggestions of the report as to how economies uh, manage the, their digital transformation will uh, be uh, responsive, will be um, important in uh, terms of uh, um, furthering their uh, economic fortune. And in here, um, I think these are very useful, harmonized and clear definition and measurement of digital indicators, coordination among key institutions, flexible regulatory environment uh, in order to nurture innovation, upgrading of education and labor market policies, and um, the, the, the need, of course, to have the key infrastructure, trade, as well as uh, logistic reforms that must be implemented. And so I actually used this uh, findings from the report, uh, as well as the PowerPoint of James. Um, I use this as guide in terms of uh, uh, presenting to you later our major strategies and policies as we pursue digital transformation. Next, please. And ter ter but turning now to um, the paper, to the presentation of uh, Toots, which uh, looked at uh, the, the um, platform economy, the indicators, the concepts, issues uh, that uh, we are confronted with. Um, of course, platforms have really disrupted uh, many uh, of the markets that uh, they have entered. And we need, uh, we need this uh, um, concepts, we need uh, this uh, mesh, um, various indicators that we can use to measure the contribution of uh, the sector. We need all of this information to help us assess and compare across countries the speed with which platforms are transforming markets. We need to really closely monitor what's happening in order to be able to align our policies and programs um, along with uh, subsequent uh, impacts on firms, on market dynamics, on people, as well as um, on the communities. And economic statistics um, currently, uh, as also pointed out by Toots, 
um, do not give a clear and integrated response to questions about the role, the nature, and size of uh, platforms. And so we have all these challenges in terms of uh, the definition, what would be the coverage, uh, what would be the classifications, and how do we obtain the data. And national statistics offices, of course, can include platforms in their surveys using indicators such as turnover and employment. And this is um, actually what our own uh, PSA is, uh, is doing. And how to capture platforms that do not have formal presence in the Philippines. I think this is one um, important challenge that uh, we're currently faced with. While, of course, we can monitor those that are operating here in the country, um, but in terms of those that are outside or do, are not located here, so how do we capture the contribution of these uh, platforms? And um, of course, th there are also these uh, large international uh, platforms that can have um, highly complicated structures in terms of the transactions being uh, routed and processed in multiple ways. So it's really very challenging for national statistics uh, offices to get a, a more holistic and a comprehensive view of uh, the different activities of uh, platforms. And hence, um, the scope for international action pointed out by the ADB is really um, important in terms of uh, uh, how do we address these uh, challenges. So ADB and other international organizations can perhaps uh, step in and um, especially as we establish the definitions of uh, what uh, would cover these online platforms. This is really an important step uh, toward a wider uptake of uh, survey-based approaches and developing internationally comparable data because um, we, we always try to um, compare our own performance with the performance of our, our neighbors and other countries uh, that are of the same level of development. And if we're using different kinds of definition, then um, it's really, uh, that's not really going to be possible. And uh, establishing online community through which experiences, case studies, and experiments could be shared. I think this is also uh, one good step uh, in order for us to be able to come up with uh, really very good uh, uh, information. And um, I, I wonder as well, uh, we, because I think we, we also need to include in the labor force surveys indicators that would estimate the number of platform workers. And by platform workers, I'm referring to individuals who use an app, like for example, Uber, so these are the Uber drivers, or a website, we have the Amazon Turk as an example, to match themselves with customers who uh, provide a service in return for money. So um, I, I, I hope we'll be able to I know it's difficult, but I think uh, it's really important that we have this uh, vital information because this would really help us in terms of uh, formulating policies and programs that would um, further um, improve or expand the growth of uh, these uh, uh, sectors. So apart from the number, we also need to um, identify what their characteristics are along with the characteristics of the jobs and the tasks that they do and the type of uh, services that are uh, uh, being provided. Next, please. So um, in the succeeding slides, uh, I, I, I just would, I would like to share with you our current uh, policy directions along with uh, some of the plans and programs that uh, we are, some are already current, currently being implemented, some are still in the planning stage. But let me also point out um, that uh, what we've seen um, um, at the height of the pandemic or uh, in 2020 is that um, there's been an accelerated uh, use of technology to work, to bu buy, and stay connected. And this has actually shaped and even changed uh, the, the habits of uh, Filipino consumers. And um, you can see on the slide, these are... Uh, what, what, what the, the, the graph uh, tells our, we, we tried to put together uh, Google searches for e-commerce and online banking in the Philippines. And as you can see, it really jumped. It re really skyrocketed in 2020. And that was uh, the highest in, in the past uh, 10 years. 
And in DTI, <clears throat> sorry, what we've uh, also seen is that um, the number of DTI registered online businesses um, went up from only 1,700 in uh, during the months from January to March 2020 to 82,000 in October 2020. And based on a global web um, survey, uh, they found that 48% uh, of Filipinos plan to do more online shopping even after the pandemic. We've also seen an increase, 624% increase in the volume of online payment transactions via Instapay. And PesoNet uh, recorded 130%. Uh, and expected uh, for expected e-commerce annual growth from 2021 to 2025 is uh, around 15%. Next, please. And um, in the in the next slide, again, uh, just to further further um, um, illustrate the same point, the pandemic uh, uh, has uh, forced traditional enterprises and startups to create new digital models digital business models in, in order for them to diversify their revenue streams. Um, again, these are Google searches for Netflix, Food Panda, Shopee um, in, in, in the Philippines. And again, you could see uh, the big uh, increase uh, in, uh, for, uh, in, in, 20, in 2020. And this is uh, Kumo. Uh, this is a local live streaming platform in the Philippines. I don't know whether you've used it, but um, um, Kumo uh, also experienced a rapid and steep growth in interest of, in uh, last year. And even big businesses such as uh, Rustans and SM, um, they, they also uh, expanded into uh, e-commerce uh, activities. Next, please. And um, in the next slide, okay. Well, um, uh, I think this is some uh, good news for us. Um, COVID-19 hit the country at a time when our innovation was starting to flourish. Um, this is the Global Innova Innovation Index ranking, which uh, uh, showed uh, an increase, an improvement. We were ranked number 54 in 2019, and last year it was number 50. Philippines is also a top digital riser in East Asia and the Pacific. And um, the, the Philippine startup ecosystem also ranked uh, the Philippines 31 to 30 among the top 100 emerging um, startup ecosystems. And note also that uh, based on the Global Innovation Index, we are number 57 out of uh, almost 130 countries in terms of creative outputs. And we're number 10 in terms of creative goods exports as percentage of uh, total trade. Next, please. Um, this is actually the framework uh, that we are, we, we've adopted. It's from the UNIDO. And what we see is that uh, new technologies can drive inclusive, resilient, and sustainable industrial uh, development by applying new technologies such as AI, machine learning, big data, and so on. We'll be able to um, improve our competitiveness and at the same time be able to increase the uh, or introduce new goods new processes new business models in in the market leading to more high quality jobs income opportunities and emergence of uh, new industries okay that's leading to a uh, uh, an inclusive sustainable industrial development next please and uh, this is our new industrial policy which we call inclusive innovation industrial strategy or IQS. I won't mention the, L, the different elements anymore, but I think I would like to emphasize that um, our new industrial strategy um, really focuses on innovation and embracing Industry 4.0 in order to improve the competitiveness of our industries. Next, please. And, um, and then in the next slide, we focused on We've already identified the 15 priority uh, industries, which uh, we, we are promoting both for the domestic and export markets. And this would include uh, new industries such as the digital technology, environment, climate change, innovation, R&D, the cre creative industry, 
um, and ITBPM, of course, and the others are from the manufacturing sector, which we try to link together with our strength, uh, given our IT strength. Next. We're also um, creating new products by building on um, using us uh, technology building blocks, uh, technologies uh, like voice recognition, AI, AR, robotics, 5G connectivity, and Internet of Things. And uh, we would like to focus on areas such as e-gaming, smart assistance, audio, video, ed tech, smart technology applications in um, factories, in agriculture, in cities, resilient technology, vehicle technology, and digital health. Next, please. Uh, we're building uh, regional inclusive innovation centers in order to link together our um, innovation and entrepreneurship uh, ecosystems. This is also our way. Uh, we, by using this uh, platform, we will be able to uh, support the uh, development of uh, new products and new processes, new services in uh, the different regions in the country. And right now we're focusing on these uh, eight regions that uh, you can see on the slide. Next, please. Um, the next slide, this gives us a picture of our uh, startup ecosystem, which is young, but with uh, a lot of promising opportunities for growth. And most of the startups are into um, various activities such as fintech and uh, e-commerce, as well as new digital uh, services. Next, please. I think I already mentioned that uh, we're focusing on fintech, e-commerce and uh, digital services. And we look at this uh, particular sectors uh, or particular activities as uh, the sectors that would be driving the uh, digital transformation in the new normal. Next. Um, the next slide, we're uh, also uh, looking at uh, uh, technologies such as uh, blockchain, agri-tech, um, AI, big data and analytics, advanced manufacturing and robotics and artificial intelligence. Um, please note that uh, these blue colored circles are, have been identified as growth subsectors. The mature ones are um, cybersecurity, fintech, life sciences and clean tech, while those that uh, were um, indicated as decline subsectors are areas such as ed tech, gaming and uh, ad tech. Next, please. Um, in the area of uh, logistics, uh, where we think uh, digitalization could really help in terms of making our supply chain uh, and logistics more competitive is by addressing challenges such as uh, high logistics costs, inefficiencies, and delays, and hence the need for uh, the application of these new technologies. And currently, um, High, high digitalization is happening only in warehouse management, at, but um, in, many, in many areas in uh, uh, supply chain and logistics, there is no digitalization. And these are in this uh, uh, gray colored uh, blocks that you can see. Next. In the next slide, uh, well, we conducted a survey just to, um, uh, for us to uh, have an information as to the level of technology utilization um, in the manufacturing industry. And as you can see, um, we, we have uh, f five uh, classifications, low technology, very low, low, high, and very high. And uh, mostly our companies are in this uh, very low to low uh, classification. So still a lot of work that uh, needs to be done. Next slide. And... Um, um, the, in, in, in this slide, uh, I, I would just want to share as well our Industry 4.0 readiness initiatives. We are formulating Industry 4.0 roadmaps, particularly for agribusiness, aerospace, automotive, and electronics. We're also building, uh, we're also um, planning to build an Industry 4.0 pilot factory as well, together with uh, an Industry 4.0 SME Academy in order to support the uh, our our uh, small and medium enterprises as they shift towards these new technologies. 
and um, also we are providing support to our uh, industries and uh, firms in terms of their uh, uh, shift towards uh, Industry 4.0 uh, uh, technologies. Next. And um, well, just to uh, summarize, um, it, it's really important for us to address digital divide, the limited, limited digital adoption and weak digital infrastructure in order to ensure that uh, nobody is left behind as we uh, pursue digital transformation. And note that the digital divide has been an issue even prior to the pandemic. And we also need to address the um, various uh, challenges that we are currently confronted with. While we have the highest internet usage, but we've been lagging behind in terms of the high cost and uneven quality of internet, limited adoption of digital payments, high cost of logistics and uh, the business environment, which is uh, characterized by lack of competition, along with the many other regulatory constraints, for instance, the need for the need for congressional franchises to build a network, um, foreign equity restrictions, and that's why logistics account for really a high percentage of uh, sales of manufacturing firms. And even the, the in, in terms of the number of towers, Philippines is uh, lagging behind. We, we, we have less than 20,000 as compared to Vietnam's 70,000 and Indonesia's 90,000. Um, okay. I, I think the last slide, this is going to be my my uh, last slide. Yeah, because the, the last one is uh, just a summary of uh, of uh, what I've already covered. COVID nineteen has fast tracked the digitalization journey of the country, and we are pursuing an inclusive innovation strategy with focus on innovation and embracing industry four point zero. And apart from building uh, the data on digital economy, we need to build the digital in infrastructure, address the regulatory constraints that limit competition, and um, improving the skills of our workers would really be very important. And we need strong government academy industry collaboration to ensure that as we pursue digital transformation, nobody is uh, left behind. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Sheila. Back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Yusek Aldaba. Um, thank you for um, uh, your, your reactions to the two presentations as well as sharing with us uh, some Philippine data on the status of digitization in the Philippines as well as uh, the Philippines Industrial Innovation Flagship Strategy and Ways to Facilitate an Inclusive and Sustainable Digital Transformation. So, friends, at this point, let us listen to the reaction of uh, Mr. Paterno of uh, 7-Eleven, also on how his company is harnessing technology to improve their operations and services. Mr. Uh, Paterno, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, uh, may I share my uh, screen, please? Uh, so good afternoon and, and uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'll, I'll share some, uh, I'll give you a PowerPoint break. <laughs> uh, okay, and uh, uh, do uh, something I found actually quite quite effective for uh, for uh, at least collaborative uh, rooms uh, is uh, one note, no? Um, so uh, I'm here to talk to you about uh, you know, uh, you know, Gwen, Gwen was saying that uh, you know, I looked at topics, and, and I think the, the audience is largely, um, you know, economists and policymakers. So I thought I'd give you some some uh, real use cases uh, that are live. Um, uh, they're so live that there's no PowerPoint presentation. Uh, and uh, so, so basically, a bit about uh, I'll, I'll I'll try to keep this to fifteen, but fifteen minutes a lot. You know. So, 7-Eleven Philippines uh, is a um, uh, uh, universe of, uh, we have about 3,000 stores um, and uh, about 100 or so shut down because of COVID, including the ones here in Boracay. 
apologize for the backdrop. Cisco doesn't allow to change the backdrop. But but the um, yeah, so three thousand stores. Um, so we estimate uh, about twenty to thirty million people uh, are within five hundred to uh, one thousand meters of a Seven Eleven. So it's, it's it's very urban. Uh, we'll go into a small town. Uh, as, as long as it's about 20,000 people um, in a in Metro Manila, we're, we we look at a catchment area of about 10,000, uh, and this this goes up as the economy grows. In uh, Thailand, it's about three four thousand. In Taiwan, uh, the densest convenience store network in the world, it's 2,000 people per convenience store. But but we have a million sari sari stores uh, who um, you know people always say that. We compete with them. We plead no contest. They're too convenient, and they're willing to um, make very little money, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, but the, the 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 one thing that does remove them is when they're actually able to get real jobs that pay uh, minimum wage, which is about double what they usually make. Um, so anyway, uh, uh, that's a bit about several. The the what I'm going to talk about uh, here today is basically, uh, and it was brought up uh, logistics um, uh, with a specific use case that is that we're working on. I, I was at a couple of meetings just this week. Uh, um, uh, there's a use case, we think, a very strong one, uh, especially during COVID, for farming. Um, the second uh, is um, we think there is a, uh, you know, we can, we can make a difference in credit. Uh, I, I believe the Philippines, a lot of the problems in the Philippines are related to the lack of credit. Um, if you think, for example, about, you know, we're one of the largest plastic waste generators in the world per capita. It's because of those, um, you know, the, the, those one peso bags of, you know, corn eggs or, or peanuts. Um, I don't think people really want to buy like one, two, five pesos. It's just that that's all they can afford for the day. Um, and that's really a lack of credit. Anyway, uh, so why are we uh, uniquely positioned again, just to know, is that uh, for logistics, um, we actually have 13 distribution centers uh, around the country. Um, it's a problem of an archipelago, right? Um, it's typically, it should be one for every 1,000, but you know, when you have an island, you have to build a DC if you want to enter the island. Um, yeah, the, the DCs deliver, they consolidate deliveries for the convenience stores uh, and deliver every day. Um, without a DC, you're not really a convenience store. You're a big sari sari store if you're waiting for manufacturers to deliver once a week uh, because you won't have space for a lot of items. You would in 120 square meters, you'd have 500 items. We have 2,000 because we operate the DCs. Um, the second uh, is credit. Why? Um, because last month, uh, we processed, uh, well, 24 billion in uh, GMV in payments. Um, this has been growing. So the pandemic, we're looking for real figures, it, it grew like 48%. Uh, basically, you know, people using online banking, Gcash, a lot of them still have to convert cash, physical cash to digital cash. And our stores play a, a large uh, part in that because, you know, we're open 24 hours where, where it's viable and where we're permitted, uh, but normally, yes, open 24 hours. Um, and our systems, we think, are reliable unless the network connection is down. Um, uh, and provide real-time uh, uh, credit you know, when, when, when the vendor allows, like for the wallets or for loan payments. We take in a disproportionate share of um, like the fintech loan payments because people like to pay at the last minute, and we offer like real-time uh, credit to the account rather than end-of-day, uh, like some payment processors. Um, this credit database is something like 20 million strong unique customers. Uh, so with credit histories, especially the guys who play loans, so this is about 3 million of them, uniques. Um, and we actually have permission to contact, uh, which is fairly unique um, because when you uh, uh, pay a bill at 7-Eleven, we say, look, in case there's a problem, you have to give us your phone number and give us permission to contact. 
So we think that that would extend to, hey, uh, you know, um, there's somebody who wants to give you credit if you're interested. So anyway, back to the logistics. Uh, um, so a bit about the, uh, yeah, let's make sure I don't exceed the time too much. But basically, you know, I, I think maybe you're developing economists. You kind of know. with farming, okay. uh, it's just browsing the PSA uh, website. Um, but it's it's three to five X, uh, farm gate to uh, wet market. Um, and you know, there, there are some areas uh, where there's a lot of concentration of agriculture. Uh, Cordillera, you know, is, is most of Luzon's cabbages, carrots, and, uh, and potatoes, no? whereas, uh, you know, the others are more evenly distributed. Um, uh, there, there's some there's wild swings throughout 2020 because uh, of the lockdown. No? Um, and uh, but basically, we took a look at our logistics costs. This is a cost because we were uh, discussing it with a. I'm on the board of a, a kind of a, a nascent foundation called the Hunger Project, uh, which is yeah, we talked about affiliating with uh, uh, Filipinas contra Gluten. But the Hunger Project is under PBSP, Philippine Business for Social Progress. Um, it's kind of led by Atene and Lasal, and the idea was to use their uh, campuses as uh, bagsakans for vegetables. Uh, Brother Amin is like a strong uh, proponent. Um, and so I was discussing with them yesterday uh, the um, what I found, uh, again, very cursory research, just PSA, but the, the the margins for different products, you know? um, like for uh, yeah for carrots, um, the farmer receives thirty six percent. The wholesaler uh, makes half of that, and the retailer makes fifty percent, hundred best. And it's a one billion a year market for NCR tomatoes. Um, you can see that also, uh, etc. So this is the existing. This is what log logistics costs are actually tiny. They're like, I, and I don't exaggerate because we actually uh, pay for trucking. Uh, we don't operate our own trucks. It, it is literally one to two pesos a kilo. Uh, maybe three if it's chill, but no more than that. I mean, that's for a 200 kilometer distance. Uh, so, you know, what is the, you guys know more than me why, why, why costs? are so high, um, but I think it's just the layers in supply chain, possibly some collusion among traders, depending on the area. But if you look at the actual unit economics, um, logistics is really small. So how do you actually make that work? That's where digitalization can work. So we think COVID is a great opportunity to go online because people are already doing it. Um, so I've been talking to uh, Tony Melotto, has this, uh, who started uh, Gawad Kalinga. We're seeing how we can work together. He has this uh, operation where he connects farmers to um, through GK uh, to people in you know, Forbes, Dasma, Bel Air, affluent villages. Um, why affluent villages? Because of the logistics cost. The drop size is big. Um, if you and if you order online, it's like a 300 peso uh, logistics fee. So you know, you'd have to buy about 2,000 pesos in our household uh, to break even. And so that's a lot. A household of 10, that's fine. But, but uh, so, yeah. Um, so, you know, we see that this, I said, you know, if, if, if you can do this, you can actually, if you can convince everybody to go online, as long as everybody was willing to eat vegetables, nobody, nobody would go home because there's Of course, on fresh or avocado, that's the hardest, hardest thing uh, is to sell produce online, sight unseen, because everybody thinks they're getting the last tomato. Um, but again, COVID is an opportunity to change that. So that's that's uh, farming. Uh, so we have, how does that work? Basically, it goes direct to the store. So we have this online grocery operation. Um, we're, we're going to scale it in April now. So we've had supply chain issues even for our main business. But basically, you you you, you shop at clickgrocery.com, and then it generates a pickup code. 
Um, and then you go to the store. Uh, there's a shelf with uh, pickup items. And uh, the, your item is barcoded. It's got your phone number. And you take it to the counter and present this and the, and the item. And you scan and you go. And that's it. Um, the logistics costs are very cheap. Because, again, we deliver every day already. So in Taiwan, 50% of all e-commerce packages run through the convenience store system. The other 50% are delivered to home, typically the higher value items. No. Uh, so we're in talks with a, uh, hopefully by you know, May or June, we'll be live with uh, well one of the larger platforms, there are only two, uh, um, to do pickup in the store at a significant uh, guaranteed volume. Uh, so we said, you know, it's, you know, we, 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 we don't know anything about farming. Uh, it's very hard to reach farmers. Um, we don't believe we're credible to consumers for fresh produce, but if, you know, like Atene, alumni could like rally and, and get people to buy online and get credit for it, there's a lot of surplus. I uh, said, we just want to be a pipe. Uh, that's all we want to be. Um, uh, except for the grocery business, because we have we have our suppliers, and, but the, and but that's just the dry grocery business. Okay, uh, so real quickly, uh, credit. So, uh, so basically, three hundred billion run rate of uh, GMV. Um, so it's, it's almost a hundred transactions per store per day. That's a, it's it's quite a bit. Um, we generate way more sales sales in uh, payments, unfortunately, because the margins are small. Uh, uh, three or four X uh, of what we sell in merchandise. How, how does that work? Um, you, have, you have the you have the Click app, right? This Click app has uh, ten million downloads. So uh, it's a loyalty app, but we said, you know, if you're going to add loyalty, why don't you just if it's the you know you have, you have to you have to do loyalty because everybody else does it. Uh, let's add all this other digital stuff on top of it so that we can leverage the the cost. So, so we added, of course, the this uh, click grocery. Um, uh, we also added a wallet. The wallet is basically like a Starbucks gift, uh, Starbucks wallet. Uh, it can only be used at Seven Eleven. So we're the largest uh, non EMI wallet in the Philippines. Um, uh, not on all 10 million users are live with the wallet because its use case is limited, but you can buy it at 7-Eleven and only at 7-Eleven. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so you pay with a barcode. Um, so we, uh, a year back, we or more, we started accepting Gcash. Uh, so you can pay with Gcash and the wallet. Um, and so we actually... Uh, have a um, we've had a interest from lenders for both the data and uh, the wallet. Uh, so there's this startup from Silicon Valley uh, called Lentina, who we're partnered with. Um, it's founded by the guy who founded the PLDT incubator, uh, Earl Valencia, who's a World Economic Forum. Some of you may know him. Um, and uh, Kevin Gabayan, who used to run, uh, is a Stanford PhD uh, AI guy, um, you know, Filipino American, uh, and they uh, they uh, he used to score, he used to lead a team that scored uh, big data credit for Google. Um, so he went to, he said, well, you know, Google's not really gonna get land at this point, so I'll try it, and I'll start in the Philippines because I'm Filipino. Uh, so they score our data, um, and we say yeah, it, it's free for you to score our data. You can choose who to lend to, uh, but in return, um, those who you don't lend to, uh, please score them also, since it's one algorithm. Because somebody else might be interested to lend to them, um, and so those are our terms. No, uh, there's another startup. Uh, well, this one's not a startup anymore. Called Trusting Social, uh, out of Vietnam, um, that uh, scored Delco data. Uh, so right now they're partnered with Globe, um, and you know they've. So they would be another uh, party that would be that we're partnering with, no, uh, in talks. But again, we welcome all players who can actually, 
you know, score our data. I mean, not everybody can. It's, it's, it's a pretty big database um, and you have to divide. And then we, we're, we're one of the largest pay in points for home credit, but they don't really score data yet. Uh, that's not their model, no. But uh, we uh, see their data. So the last thing we added that we think is compelling is uh, recycling ATMs. Uh, right now we have like 56 uh, ATM recyclers. Uh, uh, a recycler uh, is they're, they're almost all ATMs in Japan uh, are um, are recyclers. So uh, I, I think it's here. Um, you actually put money in. It's like a bill reader, but it's high speed. You can put in a stack of you know, 200,000 pesos. So you can go put it in one go and it'll credit your account in a minute, right? Um, so we think uh, this is significant because we're generating a lot of payments and <laughs> we've become like robbery targets. So it's important also. But also now you don't have to truck money to the ATM so much. So all, all ATMs in Japan, seven bank, uh, is the largest ATM, uh, second largest ATM network in the world, uh, 25,000 ATMs. Um, and we're their first uh, market outside of Japan. No? So we, we've been wooing them for a long time. Uh, their first partner is BDO. Uh, so BDO will be taking uh, deposits in June or July uh, for its wide, broader customer base. Uh, the other one, I think, is Metro Bank. Also July, but again, we welcome all banks. Um, the terms are basically, their financial terms, I can't disclose, but basically the customer withdrawal fee has to be free. It has to act like your own bank ATM, because that way we get traffic calls into the stores and maybe they'll buy something. So we think, you know, the, the, the credit and the ATMs together. The other thing about these ATMs is their uh, barcode readers. So you don't need an ATM card. Uh, so, um, uh, so that the third thing we're getting into now, uh, we partnered with the uh, one of the leading global providers. They score, uh, they do KYC for the UK post office. Uh, um, they're called Yoti uh, and uh, Rakuten. Uh, Rakuten owns Viber, among other things. Largest e-commerce company in Japan. Uh, so, yeah, um, so this would allow us to do larger remittances uh, and, you know, with the ATM, our costs are low, so we can really drop costs. Uh, remittances, uh, bank account opening, and applications. They all need KYC. Uh, uh, and this will be, you know, we, we have plans because we have an offline network, we can do online and offline. It should be, you know, one of the strongest KYC uh, uh, in, in the country. Um, I guess the last thing I'd add is the, the farming sounds a little uh, out there, but uh, if you look up Pinduoduo in China, Pinduoduo is the number two largest e-commerce company. In five years, they became the number two to Alibaba. Uh, it's a group buying site. Um, their new focus is produce because they've realized how large the margins are and how often people buy them. And, you know, you can help out farmers and give consumers lower prices because you just digitize it. It's just logistics. So that's it. Um, thank you. Uh, happy to answer any questions uh, later on. Um, okay.
Hi, sorry about that. There was uh, some malfunction in my in the unit that I am using. So thank you very much, Ms. Fer uh, Paterno. At this point, I'd like to call on uh, Mr. Thomas Abel for his reaction, sir. The floor, the floor is now yours. Thanks, Gwen, and uh, thanks everybody for joining. And um, I would just first say, I think that this research is very timely with the uh, pandemic, uh, you know, of course, accelerating the digital economy and the platforms um, playing such an important role. And it's great to have the, um, you know, the, the academic view and the view from government and also the view from the private sector. Uh, I think that's um, uh, very relevant. And what I wanna do, I'm not gonna use uh, PowerPoint um, at all. And I just wanted to, um, provide a little more context around the platforms and uh, what they can um, what what we can take away from from this because I think the research is really important to be able to measure the economy um, the, and the impact of these platforms it's very difficult and I, and I wanted to mention just three major points one is I think that the glo some of the leading global platforms um, have importance, that goes beyond even what you can measure economically. And I think that's important to understand because it might lead us to even other ways to, to look at um, the, this, this dominance. Uh, the other thing is that there are some policy changes that are happening uh, almost as we, as we speak that are gonna change some of the, uh, the, the landscape around the platforms globally. And then I, I think also in the post pandemic period, that um, there are good opportunities for Southeast Asia and, and the Philippines in particular to take advantage of the developments in the platform economy. And I'll just talk a little bit more about those. So um, on the if you look at the leading global platforms that I think you know, the, the studies uh, have, have covered very nicely, um, there are three that I'd like to highlight that are particularly important. These were, were all mentioned before, um, one of them is the uh, mobile operating systems that are dominated by two uh, platform players, Android and iOS. And um, I think that these platforms, you know, it's hard to measure. We know how many phones there are that have these, but how do you measure the impact when those platforms basically set the technology sort of um, landscape and provide a tremendous um, leverage for those owners, you know, in terms of how um, app stores would work or how uh, new technologies are integrated with phones or how, uh, you know, new um, things like uh, smartwatches and, and, uh, and, and other uh, technologies are integrated. And, and those operating systems are kind of a foundational level of platform that, um, you know, we, we we'd, would be good to understand the, you know, the market power that those create. Uh, the second one is the cloud computing platforms, which are dominated by the, you know, the probably the four leading global players, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, and, um, and Alibaba. And those platforms have sort of turned into a new layer of infrastructure. You know, we have the infrastructure of electricity and, and roads and, and um, uh, you know, and, and telcos. Uh, getting, uh, you know, communication systems, but the uh, cloud computing platforms have become a new layer of um, infrastructure that most technology companies are built on top of. And uh, that's also um, sort of showcases how important they are in terms of providing a foundation for the whole platform economy. And um, I, I think that, uh, you know, this kind of trend will you know, the, the dominance of those platforms will continue, especially now with the pandemic pushing everything towards digital. And then the third uh, area, I think, where platforms have um, excess dominance would be in uh, digital advertising. Digital advertising uh, is about 10 to 100 times more efficient than traditional forms of advertising, you know, in terms of cost per impression and that sort of thing. And um, there's been a rapid shift towards digital, digital advertising. And, you know, there's two major players, Google and Facebook, that are dominating that uh, globally. And to look at that, um, those two platforms uh, in, in terms of digital advertising, I think it's very important 
because it's it's hard to measure, you know, because when advertising dollars move towards digital, uh, they become, uh, you know, much, um, much more efficient and uh, in some ways, you know, harder to measure. So um, I think those three areas um, kind of showcase how uh, there are sort of dominant areas of platforms that um, go beyond just how much, you know, how much they um, uh, create in terms of economic impact. Because those, those actually are shaping the future of the platform economy because they're sort of like where, you know, where um, all, the, all the volume has to go through. Uh, and then the second thing that I want to cover is the um, policy developments that are coming along uh, uh, recently. I think the first one is taxation. We've heard a lot about the, the importance of taxation and um, the need to tax, uh, you know, the digital platforms uh, differently because it's so easy to shift uh, profits around in a digital world. And I think what you're starting to see is a, a, um, a, an opening up of... Um, you know the the global um, policymakers to um, making this easier to implement, um, less resistance, um, and uh, you know starting to see some countries actually um, implementing these models. And this actually will go a long way in improving the uh, digital economy, so that each country can take advantage of you know the revenues that are being generated in their country, rather than having um, you know, all of the um, the profits uh, moved offshore. The other the other regulatory or policy uh, development is this trend towards privacy, and this is also happening very much in real time. We just saw Google announcing that they're following Apple and getting rid of third party cookies on uh, on web browsing, and this is a signal that even Google is kind of giving up and and moving into uh, taking privacy really seriously. Um, and this is something that uh, we really need to follow uh, carefully. I think in this case, the elimination of third party tracking in some ways is going to uh, make the dominant players even more dominant because they actually get the first party data and they don't rely on on third party data themselves. So this uh, it is a it is a positive privacy trend. But it may also be a, a trend that um, entrenches the the um, you know the major players. This is also what happened with GDPR, which was a very good you know privacy regulation in Europe. But I think it also tended to reinforce the existing players who have a direct relationship with a customer rather than the the data brokers that don't have that. And these are very important uh, elements of the um, you know the digital economy, how we're dealing with privacy. And um, it's all happening, you know, as we speak. And uh, then the last thing that I wanted to mention is really about the uh, post-pandemic period. And, you know, we all know uh, the shift towards the digital economy has been stark, you know, because of the pandemic. Um, but the, and the pandemic has accelerated the, the, the digital economy, some people say, uh, about two, two to four years um, of econo of digital activity, um, and I think what's going to happen, you know, when we go to the new normal, as the pandemic starts to, um, uh, you know, recede, is that there will be um, an economic boom, you know, from the resurgence of activity, and a lot of that economic boom will also. Um, you know, it won't be that they'll just go back to the old ways of doing things, but a lot of the boom will uh, also be fueling the digital economy in, in other ways. So when people travel, uh, when they can start traveling again, all the pent up demand for that uh, will probably be driven more into a digital, um, you know, a, a digital um, uh, approach. And, and the other thing is that, you know, with Southeast Asia being where, you know, the place where all of the growth in the, uh, you know, the world economy is that uh, you'll, you'll see that the major platform players will continue to um, fight over market share and, um, and, you know, move more and more of their, um, their market focus. And, and I think the opportunity is also uh, enhanced because with the post pandemic, a lot of the um, uh, jobs that had been moved to uh, remote work 
will remain there. And I think there's going to be more flexibility in terms of where digital jobs can be located. I think the Philippines has already has an advantage with the, uh, you know, over a million, 1.2 million BPO workers and the strong uh, startup ecosystem that it's already a place where there's um, a, a good digital uh, talent pool and uh, as work um, from the traditional tech hubs like Singapore and Silicon Valley and, you know, and um, Shenzhen, those jobs will be more flexible to move and someplace like the Philippines has an opportunity to, to gain more of those because of the, uh, you know, the, the ad advantageous um, situation. And uh, I think that, you know, now's the time to position that uh, to be an attractive place for startups to relocate or for people who want to, um, you know, have flexibility, even, um, you know, Philippine um, nationals who may be living in these tech hubs may want to return and, and stay in the Philippines because now they can work remotely more easily. And, and then I think the last thing that, you know, we've heard over and over again, I just want to reinforce it, is that the digital divide is still very important, um, you know, that uh, the, um, the building out of the infrastructure and providing better um, internet access so that the digital economy can actually be, um, you know, benefiting more uh, people at the bottom of the pyramid and not causing more inequality. This is a challenge that we all have to take on. And, uh, you know, ADB has uh, continued to invest in uh, infrastructure, digital infrastructure, and supporting uh, policy and regulatory uh, frameworks and national broadband plans. This is something that, um, unfortunately, the platform companies aren't uh, doing this directly. They're, they're still relying on public investment usually to uh, build out the, uh, you know, the pipes to, to get people connected. And I think that's something that uh, we, we want to see, um, uh, you know, more uh, emphasis on as ADB and, you know, in, in partnership with our developing member uh, countries. So that, that's my, um, I'd say, short remarks. And I'll hand it back to, uh, to you, um, uh, Sheila. And uh, thanks again for having me. And thank you, too, um, Mr. Thomas Abel. Um, friends, uh, before we proceed to the open forum, let us give our um, presenters and uh, speakers uh, um, some time to breathe. Okay. So at this point, may, I'd like to announce to everyone that we won't have a poll today, but we will pick two WebEx uh participants and each of them will receive a PIDS notebook and I will announce their names before we close the webinar. Okay, so I can see a lot of questions already in our chat box. So at this point, may I invite our um, presenters and discussants for the open forum. I saw that uh, some of these questions have, have been answered by our uh, speakers. Nevertheless, um, for the benefit of our Facebook participants and those who were not able to see the answers to these questions, let me uh, read them. Read them in this uh, uh, during this open forum. So the first question is from uh, Novel Bangsal, E.D. Novel Bangsal of the CPBO, CPBRD, and this pertains to uh, data on uh, uh, revenue tax collect revenue and tax collections from the digital economy. So he was saying that there is a pending legislative measure right now imposing back on digital transactions. And James, um, Novell is asking is if there is any data indicating contribution or impact of the digital economy to revenue, to revenue or tax collections. Uh, would you, uh, may we know your answer to that? Uh, maybe I'd, I'd, I'd ask, um... Uh, Dr. Albert to respond because he's looking more in terms of the Philippine data. But in terms of the global and regional data, there is mm -hmm. really no uh, repository on uh, tax digital taxation. Uh, that's really one of the more, most difficult part. Our uh, ERCD is presently conducting uh, a study on uh, base erosion and profit shifting and digital taxation, and that will be completed this year. 
Mm -hmm. uh, so we will probably try as much as possible to see what little data is there for the globe and uh, for Asia and the Pacific. But maybe for the Philippines, I'll ask Dr. Albert um, in case he has additional information. Thank you, yeah. um, James. Thoughts? Yeah, uh, I I don't think there's there's I mean this is really something new. Uh, uh, the the work currently I, I think Congressman Salceda is is probably pushing a lot uh, for for digital taxation partly because we know especially now streaming video streaming alone uh, they're they're raking so much revenues but that's right. the uh, the government clearly isn't getting anything out of it uh, so that's why they're they're pushing for that at least for the big. Uh, digital platforms that are that are raking in so much money i mean even now you know i mean think of cryptocurrency uh you think that where 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 is all the money going because like if before you know, like in I, I remember when i when i bought one 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 bitcoin way back in 2016 it was just 1000 us dollars now it's 22 it's 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 more than twenty thousand dollars you know so uh so we know there's a, a, an accumulation of wealth but uh, but if somebody starts selling all of these things, the revenues, where does it all go? I mean, of course, to some extent, it goes to the banks if it it, it filters. But uh, you know, it's it's it it it, it gets lost <laughs> somehow. So unless unless governments, the only thing is there there are no clear cut rules, and and each country is now trying to find its way to understand what's going on, and that's why I think it's key first to understand the nature of all of these digital platforms they're all very different you know they're all so and because they're all different they're all trying to do do matchmaking uh, putting suppliers and and users together and and having some transactions and advertisers are coming in and so it's it's really a, ch a changing world out there but the only thing is government seems as always like in most cases especially developing countries governments are always lost <laughs> uh they're they're they 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 don't know i mean i'm, I'm glad there are a few people like you know you say aldaba at dti was at the forefront of understanding what's going on but it's partly because the you know fita has always been uh, I, 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 you know in into research and then partly she talks with people in the private sector she so she's she's into what's happening but others are really i mean <laughs> you, you, they 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 don't know what's happening <laughs> so and and it when when governments don't know when government leaders are 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 sort of unprepared to see what's what's the, the nature of of the environment then it's kind of hard also to start thinking of laws to craft what are the things to execute so unless you understand what's going on then uh i think it will be important and i think this is where the realm of of skills development should not be limited to ordinary people but especially to people in government especially to policy makers because most of the time they make all sorts of policies might, which might not be evidence-based uh, yes if i if i may add i think one uh, important aspect as well of taxing digital transaction is actually the, the nexus rule or the rules that applies on the domicile uh, status of, of the company. Because most of these companies are actually not uh, physically present uh, in, in, in here in the Philippines. And what's the legal framework for really taxing them? Taxing them? Mm -mm, the, se mm -mm. The, second, the second thing that we also need to think about is what this digital technology will do once you impose a tax. So I know everyone has heard that Facebook, I'm, I'm in Melbourne, Facebook has unfriended us in terms of access to news. And that actually came about because the regulator was basically saying to Facebook and Google, look, you are benefiting from posting and sharing of news. Therefore, you have to pay uh, payment, mm -hmm. royalty payment to news. And as a result, what Facebook did was said, OK, we will take out access of all Australians to news in Australia as well as overseas. And what, does, what, what that has happened is actually people now will have access to fake news, but not to the true news that are right. vetted and accurate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, let us now go to the next question. Uh, perhaps I can throw this to you, uh, James, and um, the other discussants can also uh, give their comments. Um, in, in the presentations, uh, there was a mention of uh, job creation from the platform economy. And Cheryl Suryano is asking how we can uh, systematically measure job creation given the absence of registration of many platform workers. 
uh, the digital freelancers, the entrepreneurs, consultants, um, and, uh, and, and the complexity behind this is the fluid, fluidity of their engagement as well because they can move from one uh, project or platform to another. So um, she wants to know if there are any lessons that we can learn uh, to measure a job creation, if the, this has been, um, uh, if there are measures uh, that we can learn from other countries in terms of, um, um, you know, addressing this? Yes, um, in terms of uh, tracking data in terms of job creation, we, in the study, we used two. One is uh, we used uh, web scraping uh, mm -hmm. to look at the key players in specific uh, digital sector uh, to measure, for example, gig labor or labor mm -hmm. on demand. So in the study, we presented that, for example, in terms of e-hailing. So mm -hmm. we know the number of drivers uh, for, uh, I think, Southeast Asia, for Grab uh, and other platforms. Uh, the, other, the other data source is actually uh, the uh, Digital Labor Index, which provides um, data of, on a global level for a specific uh, digital uh, type of uh, gig work. So there's there. But of course, this is not... Um, I think when we say labor created by digital platform, uh, there are two concepts. One is the direct creation. The other one is the indirect creation because the, the company has become more efficient and has produced more. And that's mm -hmm. what we presented in terms of the simulation exercise. So when we said if digital inputs increase by 20%, it will create additional 100, uh, 150 million jobs. That's actually not only digital labor, but all labor in general. Okay, okay. Thank you. Um, let us entertain more questions about measurement issues. No? So Toots, um, may I direct this to you? And this one is from John Pokis. Um, he's saying that uh, whenever NSOs uh, try to measure the contribution of something to the macroeconomy, they often measure it in the context of national accounts. You think it makes sense to measure the digital economy in the context of the national accounts, or is it better to design a dashboard of physical and monetary monetary indicators? Yeah, well, uh, you know, when you have a dashboard, sometimes it's kind of complicated. I mean, to think of having all sorts of things, but at the end of the day, what, what does it all mean? Mm. So MSOs have always, well, even the national accounts, it took a, a systematically decades for NSOs to get, get together and you know talk about how what would be the standards for for coming up with with, uh, with with their measurements so but the only thing is right now national accounts fails to to fully capture the, the contribution of the platform economy um, even now uh, think about you know how the the, the 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 PSA saying that okay the the performance went down of the Philippines but we uh clearly the the, the you know the, the money just does not disappear you know uh, so it, it may be going somewhere else but the only and we we suspect that that some of that might have actually gone into some some kind of uh marketplaces on facebook you know because you, mm -hmm. you already see, see some people uh you know selling their own products and and this get, get to be under the radar in a way it's something like the underground economy uh, a new underground economy it's an informal economy um, well and good if, if they're so, somehow get, getting to be taxed in some way, but but there's also been a lot of uh, what uh, uh, even with the, the the current work towards the taxation, there was there was a lot of um, uh, social media reaction, uh, violent reaction in a way that that they don't want to get taxed because wala na kaming pera. They they turn they say they we, we don't have any more any money. We're trying to survive from the economy and yet you're going to tax us again and you know we're we're still trying to 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 cope with with this crisis i think the the whole point is that uh, nso's have to start recognizing that the that all of their categories of measurements are probably very limited they've they've been like you know mm -hmm. they, and they can need to keep pace with with the the, the vastly uh, changing landscape and it's not easy for them because sometimes they also, you know, work all, all they have their own paradigms and they don't see. Toots, uh, amongst you're... themselves, okay, okay. but really talk with, with people from the private sector and get a, a better handle of what of the changing uh, economic transactions that are happening. Okay. And in your presentation, you 
we have also mentioned reconfiguring, I think, the our existing surveys, no? And also right. using um, um, inno innovative uh, data collection and uh, and uh, integrating it with traditional data sources, no? Sana nga uh, mangyari. Okay. So, okay, let us move to um, the next question. And uh, you said, Vita, if I may address this to you, uh, from Maureen Jane Orero, I think you already uh, answered this uh, question in the chat box, but for the benefit of our Facebook uh, viewers and other WebEx participants who did not see your question. Okay, Maureen is, uh, wants some clarification about uh, your mention of the gaming ad tech and ed tech as decline subsectors. And uh, he wants to know what you mean by this and what is the implication of being part of a decline sex, uh, subsector and what are the reason, reasons for being such? You said, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Maureen, and thank you, Sheila. Um, well, the chart actually was uh, taken from uh, the Genome uh, Startup uh, Report for 2020. I actually uh, provided the link uh, to uh, Maureen. It's on the chat. But uh, that, that chart actually refers to the growth of uh, startups in various uh, tech areas, and, um, and then it's... Uh, uh, actually subdivide you can divide uh, those uh, bubbles into uh, th those chart with the bubbles you can actually divide them into four four charts uh, or four uh, areas and uh, if uh, you're a growth uh, sector that means that uh, your growth would be higher than a um, hundred percent um, and these are actually the emerging emerging sectors or um, th they're not yet crowded um, as compared to, for example, the decline sectors, wherein you already have a lot of startups, and that's okay. why uh, the size of the bubble would be would uh, be measuring as well the um, uh, contribution or the share of uh, that particular technology in terms of uh, the uh, global total. So, um, okay. so sort of it has reached the saturation point, ma'am. Um, um, it's still growing, but uh, mm -hmm. compared to uh, growing, plus they have a larger share. And I, I, I think it's still okay if you move into that sector, but the more promising ones mm -hmm. would be the growth, uh, growth uh, areas because yeah. you have, uh, it's still a growing or an emerging sector, and there are few, uh, few startups in those areas. Okay. So uh, you better, better to uh, move into these areas because they are just uh, starting. Yes, thank you for the clarification, uh, Yusek. Perhaps you can uh, also give your your response to this question. Uh, okay, this is from Earl Dorado. Uh, in our plans to set up a better digital infrastructure, does it contain plans in providing incentives for local government units in assisting companies to set up such digital infrastructure? Merong bang ganun na... Incentives, incentives, but for <laughs> LGUs, not yeah. for not well, for companies. Actually, well, actually, the incentives that uh, BOI, the Board of Investments, uh, uh, is providing, um, as well as uh, those incentives coming from uh, the economic zones, they are for enterprises. Enterprises, yes. Yeah, yes. but for LGUs, uh, I think you really need to come up with a, a program either you um you 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 can incentivize those companies located in your areas um mm -hmm. in order for them either to to um invest in 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 mm -hmm. your uh, particular area or for those that are existing uh if they would be shifting to these new technologies then you can provide incentives but uh right. as to how you would be uh financing let's say the infrastructure that you would like to build i think uh, you really would need to come up with a program to raise uh, mm -hmm. uh funding you can either through bonds maybe there are lg some lgus that are issuing their own bonds in order to raise funds or otherwise um, yeah you uh have, i mean you have to look for your own funding but you they get they get uh you get allocation from uh the government revenues as well but um I, i'm not sure whether how, how sufficient that is and and hence uh really you have to um i, I guess look into your revenue generation programs or mm -hmm. measures that you can implement to raise the funds mm -hmm, mm -hmm. thank you you 
Um, this next question pertains to um, the unintended consequences of shifting to the digital economy because uh, this um, our participant Marda Alina Dumaong Dumawang Akoba is asking if uh, there has been if the study has found uh, um, effects related to the displacement of small retailers or, or SMS owners with the rise of digital platforms, considering the disparity of accessibility and connectivity between these small businesses compared with others, uh, which can afford the cost of digital platforms. Uh, can I? That uh, one, that one, may I? Uh, share? Yes, yeah. ma'am. <laughs> well, for, for SM, MSMEs, uh, that would be shifting to, to, to towards uh, digital uh, platforms. DPI can uh, provide uh, support. Um, th there are also, well, some of the programs are still in the planning stage, but in terms of the tradings, in terms of linking you up with uh, uh, Lazada or the, the, the Shopee, uh, we, we, can, uh, we can provide uh, some support in terms mm -hmm. of helping you. Um, and and uh, uh, I, I think it's also important to emphasize that with these uh, digital platforms, um, somehow, our MSMEs, uh, their chances for growth, I think, uh, would improve in the sense that they'll be able to reach out to a bigger market. Yes. As compared, mm -hmm. for example, if you're competing physically and you're not mm -hmm. able to expand your physical physical uh, um, network, then um, mm -hmm. that's quite, uh, I mean, uh, really quite challenging as opposed to you have this digital platforms that would already equalize um, more or less because you'll be able to reach out to the same consumers. Uh, but of course, you need a lot of uh, work uh, as well. And that's why government is here to support our MSMEs as well as the large ones. Uh, there are uh, mm -hmm. other uh, programs that we're uh, lining up for them. Thank you, Yusek. Um, Yusek, uh, there's also a, a comment from Raymond Pinion. You answered this in the chat box, but uh, yeah, uh, uh, Raymond uh, was suggesting that in your in your framework on government industry academic collaboration, uh, it is also important to include a civil society. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you uh, comment on <laughs> yes. this? Now? Yes, of course. You are civil society is uh, like what I uh, said. Uh, it's uh, a whole of society. It's a whole of nation approach, and uh, we've also emphasized that uh, with this shift. Uh, no worker, no enterprise, no region um, should be left behind. So, mm -hmm. kasama po, kasama po Kasama ang kababaihan, ang mga manggagawa, ang civil society, lalong lalo na. Lahat po kasama. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Yusek. And there's also one here from Kay Cordero uh, since, uh, um, and it, it concerns about uh, consumer protection. So, perhaps mm -hmm. you can tell us um, what the government is doing to intensify uh, consumer protection, particularly in line with online shopping platforms, such mm -hmm. as Lazada, Shopee, etc. Yes, yes. Oh, well, um, meron tong, uh, we, we have a consumer uh, protection group, and um, for all complaints, uh, they go to this group. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, I don't have the numbers here, but uh, um, the the number of complaints coming from online actually surged last year during the pandemic, while sales uh, increased, but at the same time, complaints also went up from um, um, uh, complaints such as uh, um, quality quality issues. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, pricey, the the prices are not reflected, and that's a violation. Even 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 on uh, Facebook, uh, I visited the marketplace of facebook okay. and they just put free and they put yeah one yeah peso. Indeed. So i was uh -oh. asking our undersecretary what is this is this a scam i mean uh they're selling a set of uh chairs for one peso and other um um expensive items i mean that and they put free and that's mm -hmm. uh i mean that again that's uh that's a violation, and uh, I looked into uh, the contract of Facebook, and that's, uh, of course, not allowed. You have to um, put the exact uh, price, and I think that's uh, their way out to uh, 
um, just to show that they're putting a price. But because uh, without the prices, then you're violating uh, uh, a law. Um, and we're also, um, there are also uh, bills at the House and Senate uh, that would uh, in, in, incorporate um, these digital platforms, for example, in our consumer protection law that would uh, enable our uh, consumer protection group to uh, be able to carry out its functions because uh, it's an old law that they are using. No, no mm -hmm. digital, the, these digital platforms uh, weren't there yet when these laws were crafted. And of course, mm -hmm. we cannot apply uh, the same uh, rules that would cover physical stores versus uh, Lazada or uh, and so on. Um, and even 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 before there was no gra uh, grab food or food panda mm -hmm. or Netflix. So um, all 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 of all of our regulations must be changed. And um, in fact, there should really be a lot of coordination among uh, the competition agency, the PCC, and uh, the data privacy uh, as well as consumer protection. All these three uh, different agencies must work together in order to ensure that there is sufficient competition and that, right. uh, uh, that, that that there is no company being able to abuse its uh, mm -hmm. market power mm -hmm. and that our uh, consumers are protected as well as the competition itself is uh, being protected so as uh, for it to be able to work efficiently. Thank you, Yusek. Okay, uh, friends, let us now jump to um, a question related to uh, skills development. Uh, some of our uh, speakers uh, have covered this topic. Uh, from um, Isaac shows Joshua Aganon, how can Filipinos pre prepare for digitalization of the economy with regard to human capital and skills development so that no one will be left behind by these changes? How can they retrain given their economic and financial constraints? Uh, PIDS has, has, uh, has had several webinars on skills development in the context of the digital economy. Uh, Toots, uh, you may want to uh, provide your response to this. Yeah, I, I think we've always been talking about the need for, I mean, for us to, even before this pandemic, we were already talking about the fourth industrial revolution and we need future skills. No? Future skills for the current labor force as well as our future labor force. But the, the only thing that we, we have recognized is, sure, we're, we're going to need these technical new, new skills, but what are they? So unfortunately, right now, we're sort of uh, still not quite sure. Even digital skills, when you say, okay, what are digital skills? Digital skills. Uh, what are... What do you mean by simple digital skills, intermediate, complex? Because what what might be what might be complex tomorrow today may actually be simple to tomorrow. You know, so these mm -hmm. are things that there's a lot of fluidity. But the only thing is, I think right now we have no specific measures yet. The our uh, our um, ITU, the an agency within the UN, the International Telecommunications Union, suggests that uh, countries uh, measure. Uh, the proportion of the youth and adults who uh, by specific digital digital skills. So they uh, they identify nine skills that we at least need to measure, like copying and pasting. You might you might say uh, uh, attaching an uh, uh, something on, a, on an email. Uh, those kinds of specific skills. Um, so our DICT, the survey that I mentioned earlier, has uh, has that measured. Uh, but they only used six out of the nine. And I was wondering, in mm -hmm. fact, why only the six, you know? <laughs> why did they, they they use the entire nine? But anyways, uh, this is one of the things I, I sort of will also tell them that they, they should have to be careful because countries need to know where you are and, so that you can plan for where you want to be, you know? Because right now, it's just not just digital skills, but also soft skills. Every, even businesses always keep saying, we need our uh, everybody to improve even on soft skills. But what soft skills? I mean, again, we get into the issue of measurement. So what exactly are they? Until now, we haven't quite made up our mind what exactly these are. Okay. James, uh, would you like to add to that? Maybe in relation to what Dr. Alberts mentioned, what I would suggest is we really need to standardize the definition of the minimum set of digital skills that all countries, uh, population in different countries uh, need to know uh, for them to be productive. 
But what Toots mentioned earlier is Filipinos are actually in the internet most of the time, right? Mm -hmm. so, which means that in terms of awareness and use, we are actually uh, very much aware. But my comment there is that the use of Filipinos uh, in terms of in their internet time is more for social interaction that re than, than really right. make making uh, business. So so I would I would support that um, uh, curriculum should also focus on financial literacy in terms mm -hmm. of how we could really gain uh, from uh, this digital knowledge uh, economically as a people. Thank you. And she let me I yes sorry 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 yes you said go ahead you asked James first. Huh? No, no, okay. James is on. No, just to, yeah. okay. Just to um, also share with you what we are doing in terms of uh, reskilling and upskilling our uh, workforce, and uh, of course, in preparation for um, the, the the greater uptake of all these new technologies in the future. Um, as you know, uh, Tesda, our tech voc uh, agency, is an attached. Uh, uh, office of the DTI, and we're working closely together with TESDA in terms of uh, the formulation of uh, skills development framework. So this uh, skills development framework would uh, um, help us in terms of uh, identifying what skills would be needed, what skills would be demanded by companies in the very near future, and then these are translated into mod training modules um, to be uh, uh, implemented by training agencies, and we're also working together with uh, with uh, CHED. Uh, we've signed an MOU um, in order to uh, also um, be able to introduce new courses or introduce uh, curricular reforms that would reflect this uh, um, new skills that would be demanded by uh, industries. We've also in uh, and as we perform this uh, di different tasks. Um, in terms of uh, addressing human resource development, upskilling, reskilling of workforce in preparation for um, Industry 4.0, we uh, also signed an MOU with uh, Singapore. So now mm -hmm. we're working clo very closely with uh, Skills Future Singapore in the preparation of those uh, skills development framework. Singapore already uh, prepared uh, so many uh, skills, meaning. Singapore has already done what we're trying to do now. And so we would we are benchmarking with uh, Singapore, but of course you cannot just uh, adapt uh, the skills development framework of Singapore. What we need to do really is uh, um, to be able to ensure that uh, the frameworks, the skills development framework that we will be developing would suit the needs of the country as well as the stage of development we're in, uh, we, are current, uh, we, we are currently situated in. So there are all these uh, efforts, um, and um, we, we've actually selected uh, already 10 industries, um, um, mostly electronics, in uh, creative industry, food processing, and construction, logistics, e-commerce, of course, is a, a big part of all of this. So uh, we'll, 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 um, inform, we'll inform the public as soon as uh, all these uh, skills di uh, digital uh, framework have been uh, completed. Thank you very much. Actually, there is a question from uh, Joseph Solis Al-Qaeda, and it's, it also concerns our educational system. He's, he's uh, asking if, um, do you think we sh the entire uh, education system, including DepEd, should engage in a massive overhaul of the entire teaching and school <laughs> administration forces? <laughs> <laughs> that will be worth another webinar. Yes, that will be worth another uh, webinar. Um, uh, Joseph, no. Uh, we can have our last question since we only have a, um, a few minutes left. And uh, perhaps uh, James can answer this. Uh, we have a question from Albert Lee uh, about current research directions on redesigning supply chains for the circular economy. Um, perhaps you can, you can share uh, sure. what's in the pipeline probably or what's in the radar of ADB when it comes to this topic. Yes, uh, in, with respect to uh, current designs uh, in terms of supply chain for a circular economy, definitely after COVID, uh, ADB is really focusing to build back better and greener and really to encourage uh, the use of renewable energy, the use of recycling to minimize the impact because we know that uh, one of the positive side of this COVID and lockdown is our environmental indicators have improved a little bit. And as we open up, 
we want to maintain uh, that this green economy uh, will will be given uh, due attention, and particularly because uh, the focus of uh, CSR and I think in terms of environmental and social uh, uh, governance ESG, it's really increasing. So there is now a, a, a framework on I, I think the circular economy coming from the lessons learned from uh, advanced economies that has adopted this, uh, Australia and, and mostly in European countries. And a few ASEAN uh, countries are already in the process of adopting this circular economy. So I think in Indonesia, it's a very strong uh, focus. Uh, I, I would uh, defer to FITA in terms of what are the plans in the Philippines. But yes, building back better and greener, I think is really critical. Yes, FITA, would you like to add to that? Um... Well, um, I've um, maybe because I was in a hurry when I presented it, but um, green, um, greening the um, green products, climate change, environment friendly products, these are uh, very important priorities of uh, the DTI. Even recycling, we, we, we we're very currently supporting that. So um, um, rest assured that uh, we are uh, taking care of uh, all of these uh, new things that uh, must be uh, uh, must be given uh, proper attention by government in terms of our policies and programs. Thank you, Pita. Friends, uh, there are lots of takeaways that we can glean from today's conversation, from the presentations and uh, the reactions. We have seen the vital role of the digital economy in the region, including the Philippines. It is facilitating the convergence of industries, generating substantial revenues and creating jobs. And the COVID-19 pandemic has fast-tracked the country's digitalization journey, and we, we need to keep the momentum going. During, during this pandemic and in the post-pandemic period, countries like the Philippines have good opportunities to take advantage of platform developments. Other bright spots, as we have Heard from the presentations include the presence of an innovation industrial strategy in our growing fintech and e-commerce sectors. We have also seen how the private sector is increasingly embracing technology to adapt to, adapt to the fast evolving business landscape. However, to fully expand the digital economy, we need to address the issues that are obstructing its growth, such as those related to digital divide, infrastructure, um, skills uh, development, data privacy and security, foreign investment limitations and regulatory constraints that limit competition. We also need better and more accurate measurements of the income derived from digitalization. At present, the government and the private sector still lack the data required to understand it fully. We need to develop new ones and more holistic measures of the digital economy so that we will be more equipped to make decisions. Our policymakers will be more equipped to make decisions and interventions for its long-term growth. And this is where regional cooperation is necessary to come up uh, with internationally uh, comparable data and develop mutually beneficial policy and programs to advance the growth of the digital economy. Please join me in thanking our presenters and discussants for the valuable insights that they shared with us this afternoon. Let us give them, let us give all of them a big virtual clap. Um, we have we heard the recommendations of our speakers, but admittedly, without the support of our legislators, those recommendations will remain a wish list. And this is why we invited as our closing speaker someone from our legislative legislative branch who can share with us some ways forward. Um, our closing speaker serves as the chairperson of the Senate Committee on Finance. He has sponsored uh, or authored more than 200 laws in a six, 16 years as legislator. And in support of the, of the digital economy, he has filed the National Digital Careers Act and the National Digital Transformation Act, two bills which have garnered renewed interest in light of the COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Sani Angara. Hello, everyone. Allow me to greet uh, Dr. Sawada, uh, Dr. Reyes of PIDS, our presenters, Mr. Villafuerte, Dr. Albert, our panelists, TTI's Yusek Aldaba, uh, Philippine Seven Corporations, Mr. Paterno, 
Mr. Abel of ADB. Uh, greetings to all of you and to all the participants. Our gratitude goes out to ADB and PIDS for hosting this webinar and to all our panelists and presenters. Uh, we thank them. Uh, as an opinion, a newspaper editorial said recently the, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated our digital transformation wittingly or unwittingly. And uh, it's digital or bust, so to speak. You know? So this underscores the urgency of growing our digital platforms as pointed out by senior economist uh, James Villafuerte of ADB. 20% uh, expansion uh, provides huge dividends, as many as 2.2 million jobs per year over the next five years. And of course, many challenges as well. Uh, and of course, what is important here is that uh, the law will shepherd the technology rather than lag behind the technology or hinder the technology. And of course, given the cross-border nature, the supranational, supranational nature of uh, digital transactions, uh, there will be challenges ahead. Another challenge is uh, uh, perhaps updating our laws uh, to be a handmaiden of progress uh, and expansion, the digital uh, expansion. Uh, many studies have pointed out that our laws and regulations are somewhat antiquated dating back to the 1930s, uh, as far back as the 1930s. And uh, some have also pointed out that some of our laws don't encourage competitive markets uh, in the uh, arena of uh, uh, technology and communications. Uh, another challenge, of course, is our uh, infrastructure, our telco infrastructure. And we tried to address this in uh, the Bayanihan 2 law, which we passed uh, in the second half of last year, where we have a provision which drastically cut short the number of government licenses and permits needed to put up cell sites uh, and towers to give us a chance to uh, rapidly accelerate uh, the building of these cell sites in the next three years, which is the time period for uh, the short-end processes under the Bayanihan 2 law. Um, and of course, another aspect uh, worth pointing out is the digital competencies and competencies and skills of our countrymen, because uh, uh, we need to be up to the task. Uh, and uh, here, crucial are educational agencies, the DepEd, Department of Education, the CHED, the Commission of Higher Education, and the TESDA uh, for skills training. Uh, a PayPal study said that we have uh, per capita one of the highest uh, percentage of freelancers, uh, numbering anywhere from uh, a million and a half to two million Filipinos. So it's a quickly, a rapidly growing area, and uh, uh, there's a lot of opportunity, especially for our young people. Uh, that so-called demographic dividend that we hear a lot of uh, lately. So. Uh, there's a lot to ponder, a lot, to, a lot uh, of opportunities ahead, and as one of my colleagues in the Senate is fond of saying, we should never let a crisis go to waste, and it is a chance to uh, make those changes which have proved uh, stubborn in the past. And again, we thank ADB and PIDS for uh, leading the way here uh, in this webinar uh, for digital transformation. Thank you, and uh, wish you all a good day. Salamat po. And thank you too, Doc. And thank you too, um, Senator uh, Sunny Angara. Um, before we finally close, I would like to announce the two winners who will receive a PIDS notebook. They are Nicole Meredith Buklau. Frederick and Frederick Di Maano, I repeat, uh, Nicole, Mary Lau and Frederick Di Maano, um, our webinar team will get in touch with you for uh, the delivery of your uh, prize. And finally, friends, we have uh, some reminders. Thank you, Mike. 
Okay, so uh, you can access all the presentations from today's webinar from the PS PIDS website, including the uh, the links to the full studies. Also, uh, please answer the uh, feedback form that will pop on your screen after the webinar. Next slide, Mike. Okay, uh, we hope that you will uh, answer our feedback survey so we know how to better improve our virtual events. Also, please regularly visit our website and social media pages. Uh, the links are on the screen. And thanks again to all who uh, tune in with us today in our Facebook uh, page, as well as uh, um, who followed our uh, live tweets um, on Twitter. Also, we have one more webinar this uh, March on the 25th. We have our webinar on uh, online platform work, the Asian experience, featuring two papers um, written by uh, PIDS researchers. And finally, uh, we would like to thank everyone, um, all the representatives from um, various organizations uh, from the government, academia, civil society, business, and international development community who join us today. Uh, friends, uh, we hope you have learned something valuable from our webinar this afternoon. Again, thank you to the um, Asian Development Bank for uh, partnering with us in this virtual e event. So friends, please stay safe and stay healthy and stay informed too. Thank you and good afternoon. Maraming salamat po. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much, James, very much. Dr. Sawada. Thank our um, discussants, yeah, Mr. Paterno of Asik Tita. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, everyone. Stay Thanks. well. Thank you. Mr. Thomas Abel, thank you. And thanks to all of you for uh, participating in our webinar. See you on March 25th. Bye-bye.